Okay, uh, the next book I have for everyone is um, really one of the better novels that I've read over the last few months. Um, I do read quite a bit of fiction, and uh, this is what it is. It's called uh, The Glass Bees by Ernst Junger. It's got an introduction by Bruce Sterling, and uh, it's translated from the German by, uh, by a woman named Louise Bogan. Uh, this is a book put out by NYRB about 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, the New York Review of Books started re-releasing and uh, putting back into print some, some books that they perceive to have been really good, but sort of have fallen by the wayside, don't get many readers anymore. Um, and I, th I think in the United States, one of those one of those authors and one of those books is certainly Ernst Younger and certainly The Glass Bees. Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting book, originally published in German uh, by a really fascinating character, Ernst Junger, who whom I'll speak about in a moment. But um, Junger is probably best known for his book, uh, which recounts uh, basically a set of his memoirs uh, that he wrote about serving in World War I. Uh, it's usually translated into English as Storm of Steel. Uh, but almost four decades later, in 1957, he published this book, The Glass Bees. And uh, it it's one of the dozens that he wrote during his life. And uh, really one of the better uh, pieces of what you might call dystopian fiction uh, that I've that I've ever read. Uh, the translation by Louis Bogan deserves special praise for uh, what I think is its effortlessness and its attention to detail. So often translating uh, fiction like this uh, can end up producing something dated and stolid, uh, but this is just, uh, she, she really brings the English, the subtlety of the English language to bear on this book and, and does a beautiful job with it. Uh, the Glass Bees is not what you would call an action-packed book. Its entire plot consists of a down-and-out man named Richard uh, trying to find a job, uh, speaking with his friend who might have an inside lead uh, for a job, and the job interview that eventually results. And it's interspersed with uh, uh, quite a few flashbacks to uh, Richard's military days. Remember, uh, the military was very uh, important to Junger, obviously, having served in World War I. Uh, the central character, uh, however, is neither Richard nor his friend, but the Magus-like Zapparoni, who is the man who Richard's friend recommends for a job interview, uh, who runs this factory uh, where Richard goes for the interview. And Zapparoni lives in, a, in seclusion, and he runs his operation uh, sort of from from a distant uh, uh, a distant house, close to his, somewhat close to his his factory. But he's he's a very controlling figure, but he keeps his distance. He's very, like I said, Magus like, um, and they do really off the wall weird weird things at this factory. Um, some of the things they do, uh, one of the things they do is create um, androids. Extremely sophisticated looking anthrop anthropomorphic robots who star in the films that Zapparoni makes and produces. Uh, everything Zapparoni makes uh, requires such skill, such tremendous attention to detail and artisanship that he stocks his factory with hundreds of workers who were devoted to him utterly. Uh, he has this sort of charismatic ability to manipulate the people who work for him and uh, perhaps a demonic desire to change the world through the, uh, through, the, through the transformative power of technology. And of course as someone who grew up um, at the very beginning of the 19th century and whose formative years were in the 20s and perhaps 30s, sort of charismatic political figures uh, would be very important and relevant 
uh, for someone like Ernst Stiller for obvious uh, historical reasons. Uh, back to the book. While waiting for Zabroni to conduct his interview, uh, he, he waits in the garden outside of the factory. And his senses, he finds them being slowly overwhelmed and dulled by Zapparoni's meticulously constructed glass bees. The glass bees of the title. Uh, there are hundreds of them just flying around in the garden uh, with these infinitely minuscule complex parts made out of glass and hundreds of of nano, nanoscale parts uh, in, in there, and, and, and they're just these exquisite little pieces of art. But they're so, there's so many of them, and, and, and their movement just sort of puts puts Richard into a trance that renders him unable to tell anything about his surroundings. And from this bizarre experience, Richard resolves not to take a job at Zabroni's factory, uh, perhaps not the worst decision he could have made, um, thinking that he might use his power for something other than good. Uh, but he ends up changing his mind and takes a position as a sort of ombudsman at the factory. And he helps the often querulous workers get over their artistic differences, which they have quite often. And in the end of the novel, we're left hanging. We never really find out whether Richard would live to regret his decision of staying on as an ombudsman, or whether he retains his sense of personal dignity and integrity and freedom of conscience, even though he's working at Zapparoni's factory. Hunger was often accused of being a fascist, and it's really no surprise reading this book, but not for the reasons that one might think. Other than his sweet, evocative remembrances of military life that I mentioned before Zapparoni, Junger never recommends the things we think of as uh, part and parcel with fascism, like authoritarianism or anti-parliamentarianism or the cult of the leader, or uh, that word I used earlier, the charismatic leader. But some fascists were known for their deep, agonistic mistrust of technology and innovation, so far that they idealized the pastoral, rustic idol of life before industrialization. And I'm not sure that, that Junger is going that far here, but you can certainly detect that sentiment. There are no such idols here, as I said, but Hunger does have a distinctly suspicious stance toward technology and the mesmeric power that it can so easily exert over people. He probably would have seen the advent of people simultaneously attached to their Blackberry, their iPhone, their iPod, and their Bluetooth as unfortunate but inevitable. Uh, excuse me, inevitable. And for being over half a century old, his, his technological anxieties are really brilliantly and beautifully articulated here. Uh, his bees and his robots are uh, progenitors of the nanotechnology that is so ubiquitous and inescapable today. Junger uh, wrote, a happy century does not exist. As someone who saw World War I and almost the entire 20th century, he died in 1998, uh, a month before his 103rd birthday. But he adds with a kind of humane caution, while a happy century does not exist, there are moments of happiness and there is freedom in the moment. Uh, words to dulcify a looming technopolis. Right? The Glass Bees by Ernst Junger.